Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie Vaughn with the How She Got There podcast, sponsored by Next Level. And today I am here with the Blue Canoe CEO, Karen Taylor. Hi, Karen. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you. How are you, Jamie? I am doing great. Now, we are so excited to have you on. I want you to be able to come on here and share your heart. I want to hear where you grew up and what you thought you were going to be when you grew up. Oh, gosh. Well, I grew up moving around a lot, um, based, sort of based in California. That's where my family is and was. And um, But we moved abroad uh, pretty early on and even yeah. before I was born. So I grew up in Latin America and my earliest years were in Trinidad uh, and okay. Venezuela. And, and then we moved back and I ended up going off to an international school after I guess that early experience. Um, so it's kind of this combination of a very local place in central California, mm -hmm. um, you know, where not many people had traveled and then we'd come and gone a couple times. And then I went off on my own to New Mexico and, and headed toward, you know, college and so forth. Okay, so where'd um, you go to school? I, I went off to, in New Mexico, I went to an international school called the United World College. Okay. Uh, it's a system of about, gosh, it's a growing system. I would say we have about 17 or 18 campuses around the world now. And so it was this wonderful introduction to going to school with people from uh, just over 80 different countries and, you know, countless cultures and languages and it turned me on to a way of thinking that was way outside of just, you know, here I am in this one place and, mm -hmm. and this is who I am. Uh, it, it really turned me on to sort of international thinking, I think. Mm -hmm. And where did you go to college? And what did you oh, I, yeah, I headed out to Washington, D.C. after that and went to Georgetown University. Mm -hmm. I, I thought at the time, so kind of like who I thought I would be, I really mm -hmm. wanted to be a diplomat. I wanted to be uh, doing something, you know, internationally that involved understanding and international relations. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the School of Foreign Service there at Georgetown University, thinking that that would be my path. And I found that it wasn't. I, <laughs> I found it to be very competitive in a way that I'm not really wired. Mm -hmm. And um, so I soon found myself wondering, you know, what is it that gives me joy? And that's been a big part of, I think, my path is you know, where is it that I find joy? And it was at the time it was with English literature. Mm -hmm. So I made it in English literature and, and did some volunteer teaching. And I think that really turned me on to education. Yeah. And so you went um, from college into education. Is that how your career started? Yeah. Well, I, I went from college to um, some time off traveling, went to Europe, okay. and, you know, trying to think about things. Um, but pretty early on, right after college, I started teaching um, and and I realized I wanted to be a language teacher. Mm -hmm. So I went to graduate school and uh, became, uh, got a master's in teaching English as a second or foreign language. Mm -hmm. So anybody you know who says they're an ESL teacher or a, a TEFL teacher or any of those ESOL, all those things refer to the same thing, teaching English as, a, as, a, as an additional language for the learner. And that's, that's where I really um, found my career calling was the linguistics of it, um, the, the the personal part of it, connecting with people, uh, the identity part of it, you know, like where how a person changes as we speak another language. Or do we have the same personality in both languages? Those kinds of questions really intrigue me. Yeah. Uh, language is always something that I was never good at, meaning I had to take Spanish in high school and could not pass that class. My sweet, wonderful teacher was sweet enough to pass me. <laughs> I could graduate high school. I could do everything else but Spanish. And I wish my brain was wired that way. But I guess that comes from growing up abroad, really, for you, that you were just immersed in that. It certainly, it does have an impact. I mean, the brain is in a different state when you're younger. Um, it's in a what we call kind of a more plastic state, a more mm -hmm. flexible state. And so, you know, I, I, people say, well, you know, do you speak Spanish? I speak Spanish, but am I bilingual? I'm pretty fluent. Um, I grew up speaking Spanish, and then I forgot it. And then uh, because I'm not from a Spanish speaking family, right? And so then I got to experience what it is to learn it again. Mm -hmm. And that was later in high school, college. And I wasn't super enthusiastic about it because it seemed so booky, you know, book oriented. <laughs> yes. But what I found is the sounds, the, the sounds really stayed from my early childhood exposure. And so it does help, but it's not, it's definitely helpful, but it's not necessary. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, 
it's possible. And that's what I want um, in the case of English learners. I want I want to provide them with services and products. And that's where I've kind of come to is mm -hmm. reaching out to people who don't consider themselves uh, really that talented with languages, but who need to, to speak English for a job or for, uh, for any number of reasons. So tell us, how did that career as an ELS teacher trajectory you into being CEO of Blue Canoe? Yeah, so there's a little story there. So I started off with the notion that I would simply uh, get a good job at a university. And mm -hmm. I had a friend at a university. And so I, I, you know, visited and I observed her teaching. And I had my master's degree in teaching at this time. And so I, I was at University of Maryland. And I, I just loved the collegiality and the university setting. And mm -hmm. what I wanted was that, you know, that lifetime job. Um, and just like we all, you know, I don't know, my dad had a lifetime job, a career. I wanted a career. <laughs> and so I, um, I I realized I'd have to have some experience uh, before I could do that. And um, and I did. I moved abroad. I went to Namibia and started teaching English. Okay. There. Yeah, that's Southwest Africa, mm -hmm. former Southwest Africa. Uh, taught some English there and started getting that experience. Ended up at University of Maryland. And that was just before just before 9-11. Um, so 9-11 changed everybody's lives and changed mine in, in this, you know, in this way for me. Um, not, not a tragic way, but just a, a shift in what I was doing. Um, university students lost their uh, visas. So we didn't have many international students and the department was basically decimated. You know, we were taken down to almost, almost nobody. And I headed off into a new job. So I moved into adult education working with immigrants and um, by this time I had developed a tool though for teaching and it was very early on when I first got to University of Maryland this tool was this this chart for teaching um, the vowel sounds of English and for teaching pronunciation and so it started um, spreading the students liked it my colleagues liked it uh, we lost our jobs we had to go off and get new jobs and people went off with this chart Mm -hmm. I was also teaching graduate students at American University, and they went off with this chart. And so this thing that I had developed to teach pronunciation with started becoming its own thing and started taking on its own life. And um, I, I still didn't really recognize that at the mm -hmm. time. I was just interested in teaching and training teachers and uh, methodology and linguistics. Um, and so I was doing all of that along with technology. I was training teachers in the use of technology. Um, so lots of jobs. You can kind of get that, you know, that that 30 something um, DC area, lots of jobs, a bunch of commuting and sort of a sense of how many more things can I do? <laughs> um, but there came a point where I just felt like it was getting really frenetic and I didn't know what would come from the soup. You know, I don't know what I didn't know what I was making. I didn't know what this recipe was. And I saw an opportunity to go abroad again. And I grabbed a Fulbright grant to go to Mexico. And so I did that. And I, I offered to do what I already do. I said, you know, I'll teach uh, teachers how to use technology. I will teach methods to teachers who want to teach English. And I will uh, continue sharing what I know about teaching pronunciation uh, to non-native speakers of English. And so I spent a year there and um, and that went well. And, you know, the chart was around, but really I was focused on this career as a trainer. Mm -hmm. And so then long story short, after I came back, basically this thing called the color vowel chart, it kind of went, I mean, this is before viral. This is before, mm -hmm. uh, right before Facebook came public. So, but it had become viral in its own non-digital way, right? It had come through word of mouth, a lot of people sharing it. Um, my former graduate students had gone off to the State Department and were now abroad teaching English using the color vowel chart. And wow. things were boiling, you know, kind of bubbling up a bunch of noise around this thing that really, I mean, so many teachers create things that solve problems. Mm -hmm. And I, I imagine many are unique. Mm -hmm. and I had this sudden opportunity to recognize like, wow, this must be, I wonder if this is unique. And I started to see that it was. Um, and so I went through a couple of key motions that I just thought, you know, I'd better just do this. Mm -hmm. I got a copyright 
I filed yeah. for it. I didn't just put the little circle, you know, I, I really went through all the motions on that. Um, so I got the copyright and that was important. Um, I also got a trademark and, yeah. and I recognized, you know, at first I didn't know how those were different. And then I realized like, oh, those are different. So I did that. That was my next question. If you had gotten those. <laughs> yeah. And I just thought, you know, I need to know, you know, people need to know that this is legitimate and I need to know that it's not going to be used in some other way. So right. that was the idea. Um, and about that time, so something started really interesting started to happen. I started having teachers contact me and say, Hey, I made this, you know, this activity, or I made this poster, or I did this. And I would say, this is fantastic. I love this. So this need to kind of, I wanted to show other teachers what this teacher had done and, and so forth. Uh, but one teacher in particular came to me and stood out who said, she said, I've done a few things. I made a game with your chart and I want to show it to you. And she was, I was living in New Mexico at the time and she was down the road from Santa Fe down in Albuquerque. And she, uh, she finally got me, you know, in a room one day and said, I want to show you this game. And she showed it to me. And we realized, and we started playing. I was like, wow, this, this is, this is something. Mm -hmm. So it's a spoken card game. It's a game, you know, most card games you just play while you're talking about something else. Mm -hmm. But this was a card game that you, you speak the turn and there's, I won't go into detail, but there's enough structure in there that you can succeed even if English isn't your first language. Okay. And even if you don't know a lot of words, you can still play and you can still win. Mm -hmm. And so that was pretty neat. That was a pretty brilliant little design there. And so that was, that's Laura McIndoo. And, and I'm now going to start laying down the names of the women who okay. really are responsible for my path. Um, and I'm, I'm going to see if I can remember everybody, but um, it's important to me because I think, you know, what we're doing in this conversation is talking about where we end up and how we got there. And for me, it's, it's a path that's been paved by women, despite I mean, never really thinking of myself as, you know, I don't know, uh, being a woman, I guess. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to have to put some thought into that. Um, not being a woman professionally, I guess. You just assume you're a woman in teaching, I guess. Um, so Laura had introduced me to this game and we knew it was powerful. It was powerful for uh, people of all ages and all learning levels and native speakers like the game too. Okay. So we did a Kickstarter. This is the first businessy thing. Well, the first businessy thing I did was getting that copyright and the trademark. And I had a little company to, to sell these little charts, right? These posters mm -hmm. and, and little things. And I had a co-author, I need to mention, um, Shirley Thompson, who was just right by my side, um, figuring out we have to make a company because people want to buy this thing. And I don't want to get into trouble with taxes or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so we made a company and so the LLC. And um, I still have that company. That's not Blue Canoe, you know. So we printed things. I learned about barcodes. I learned about ISBNs. Mm -hmm. and every time I did one of these, I thought, oh, my gosh, I wish somebody else could do this. You know, <laughs> like, why, why do I have to learn about barcodes? Um, but we did. And we sold these products. And we trained some teachers. And then this card game came along. And we thought, we have to manufacture this thing. Mm -hmm. Meaning, you know, we made it on sort of card stock. And it was pointy and not fun to shuffle and and it was getting more and more popular so so we did a kickstarter and a, a, a crowd fund you know fundraising kind of thing and we did it we raised enough money not only to manufacture but to do this other thing and so i'd mentioned the copyright i'd mentioned the trademark the other part of that trifecta is when you've done something um, innovative that solves a problem that hasn't been done before mm -hmm. it's a patent and, and right before we were going to sell this game, which is the critical moment, I realized sort of going to bed one night, I was like, oh my gosh, we can't sell this. We need to apply for a patent before we sell it. And that's kind of the, the critical marker. And so we did. And we, it, I've never done so much work in my life to get that patent application in, but we did it. Um, so a bunch of us, Laura, Shirley, myself, you know, suddenly we're this, this group of people uh, applying for this for this patent. And, um, and that's what in the end, it, it just piqued enough curiosity from enough people, the manufacturing of it, the patent. Um, so then I, I, it's so much fun telling a story. <laughs> I, I mentioned that I went to New Mexico to this international school. Well, that was back when I was about 16. 
and I I had a classmate who had gone into technology, uh, you know, high tech. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I contacted him during the Kickstarter and said, just like I did to all my classmates, would you like to give money to my Kickstarter? And essentially he said, he said, no, I, um, but I want to know what that game is. Mm -hmm. And so I sent it to him and he played it with his kids. And he said, I like this game. I think we could make an app out of it. Oh, wow. I was like, oh, well, you know, people have been asking us, when are you going to make an app? Mm -hmm. you know, people throw that around like it's, I don't know, like going to the store and buying mm -hmm. a six pack or something. It is not easy to make an app, at least not the kind that we had in mind. And so I had looked into it a bit and it was overwhelming and mm -hmm. expensive. So when this friend said, you know, I, I have a startup, I have an incubator and I think we can make an app. Uh, would you like to do that? And I said, sure. You know, so we, we ventured out, we did this, you know, uh, he found uh, a wonderful CEO, uh, Sarah Daniels, is the next woman on my wonderful path of this journey. Uh, Sarah Daniels is a professional CEO out of Seattle and had worked on some high tech projects. And uh, so she was the one of the co-founders of this company, Blue Canoe. And it was a partnership uh, with, you know, a bit of work with my company. Um, and we worked together to basically build all of this color vowel pronunciation work into an app uh, that could listen to the user, um, mm -hmm. listen to their English, and give them feedback using this system that had developed uh -huh. with this patent, right? So we had a patent, we had a method, and now we could build it into this app. And, uh, and that's been the last six years now that we've been building Blue Canoe. It's a handheld app that non-native English speaking learners use to improve their awareness, their production, and their confidence about speaking English. So that's kind of where, I mean, it's, it's a lot of wonderful women along mm -hmm. the way. I think I've, I've uh, touched on, on most of them. Um, but it's, it's basically a lot of people coming together and saying, we believe it, that we believe in this thing because we know it works. And that's, that's been the big push. It was never a desire to be, uh, to be making an app. Mm -hmm. Now there's one more part of the story, which is, you know, now I'm the CEO mm -hmm. and, and that's where it really does come down to, you know, how we pass things along. So when this company, you know, started off as a startup and it's, st I still consider it a startup, um, but every startup has, it's kind of the, the beginning, it has a rise, it might have a, a leveling out, a plateauing. And at this point, uh, Sarah found some wonderful new opportunities and, and we looked around the room, it's like, who's going to lead this company? And, and to my, I was surprised, but in time I started to see like, maybe that could be me. Mm -hmm. And I think it's only because I was able to already see a model of, because it is really different the way men lead and the way women lead a lot of the times, not, yes. not always and not categorically, but a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So here I had seen this super CEO, you know, who knew how to really engage a team of people, uh, with different personalities and to keep everybody still communicating and moving forward. And I thought, well, if she can do that, maybe I, maybe I can too. Um, so Sarah's it continues as an advisor to Blue Canoe, and that's basically like a mentor to me that mm -hmm. allows me to figure out the businessy stuff of running a corporation, and uh, and I just try not to let it be too big for me. You know, it's I have to keep it all manageable in a day. Yeah, I understand. That's an amazing story. And just so everyone knows, she didn't think she had a story to tell us. And she did. <laughs> you had a great story to tell us. Right. How do you balance work and home life and family and all of those things, if you can, even? Yeah, I don't know about that. Um, I have two kids. My husband and I have two kids. They're twins. They're 13 years old. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's hard. <laughs> That's what I can say. I think I always have to remind myself that there's a there's a benefit built into all of this night and day work, you know, where I I break out and take somebody to a event or, you know, I pick them up from school and, you know, we always have family dinners. That's that's important. But um, I have to believe that there is a benefit to my not being the classic, you know, whatever that classic is, but that super available mother um, mm -hmm. that I. I'm just frankly not always that available. 
and I, I have to guess that the benefit is that I'm modeling, you know, you can do this, mm -hmm. just like everybody else modeled for me. Mm -hmm. um, but it's hard. It's, it's, I'm not sure. I feel pretty conflicted about it, frankly. Sometimes I wonder, you know, what if, what if I were just to kind of put this all, I don't know, on ice? <laughs> Sometimes I think I could, I could just go work at Trader Joe's, you know, and <laughs> have like certain hours and friendly and, you know, work with other people. It's a lot of work and it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of isolation sometimes mm -hmm. uh, being, you know, leading a couple of companies together. Yeah. And, I do um, understand that. But I do this from home. You know, I have always done it from home and it, partly because so much of what I do is online uh -huh. with, with the pandemic, of course, that just reinforced how useful it is to work from home. Um, leaves a little flexibility for I'm my own boss so I can go to my kids events and um, you know, we can take a little vacation here and there. Right. But it's a lot of work. <laughs> so what is the best career advice you've ever received? Hmm. Recently, I received advice from my board. Um, I do have a board, you know, corporations have boards and I'm lucky to have some really good board members. And so I, when I took on the position, I went around and pretty much interviewed everybody, everybody who works for the company and the board. And I did ask, you know, for all kinds, of, I asked all kinds of questions, but one of them was advice. And, and the best advice I, I got recently was, uh, as it says, CEO, is to watch your time. Be very conservative with giving away your time. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a very important um, thought for, I think, especially for a woman. Right. Um, and it may be especially for a teacher which is what I am. <laughs> I'm an educator from beginning to end. And what we like to do as teachers is you put everything on hold the minute somebody needs you and you just stay with them mm -hmm. and give them what they need until they have it. And you don't know how long that'll be. Mm -hmm. So that idea of, you know, staying after class and uh, spending time with a student, that is definitely hardwired into me. And I have to moderate that. Mm -hmm. And be careful not to just chat with anybody who asks, hey, can we chat sometime? <laughs> I better have a really clear idea of, of why are we chatting? What is the outcome? Um, or is this worth setting aside as an exploratory conversation, you know, where I don't know what the outcome is? Mm -hmm. So it's it's just kind of being more mindful about how I'm going to use my time. Uh, what's the outcome? How do we make sure that that follow through happens? And so I've, I've been very impressed with the people I've met um, in in the company and in general, now meeting other people who are CEOs and, and who are executives, and they're amazingly good at managing their time. So I, I continue working on that, especially with two companies, which I do run both. Yeah. So if somebody wants to get the Blue Canoe app, is it available now? It is. It's been in the App Store and in Google Play for several years now. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's Blue Canoe Learning is the app. Uh, there are a couple of other things that'll come up if you just put Blue Canoe. So Blue Canoe Learning, and um, it is available with a free version. It's called a freemium model. So there's a free version that is a forever free version. You can keep it. It's not like a trial that will expire, but built in there is the option of unlocking all of the features. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a trial in there that's a seven, I think it's a, there's a trial in there. That I think it's seven days, it might be two weeks. Um, but you get that trial. And with that, like a lot of models, um, that's when you opt in with some payment information and you choose to turn off if you choose not to continue. Okay. okay. And if somebody wants to get the card game or your chart, how do they do that? Yeah, they can go to colorvowel.com and we have a shop there. Uh, so that's that's a game for ages. I don't know, with support, a kid, a precocious reader as young as four has played it with their family. Um, but to be, you know, kind of a clear set of who to give it to would be ages seven all the way through advanced adults. And okay. uh, people with, you know, exchange students would, would do really well with it if you have an exchange student, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and then with both of those, we offer for anybody listening who is themselves a non-native speaker of English mm -hmm. uh, or a teacher who's interested in all of this, mm -hmm. I give a free class to the world uh, twice a month, and that's on Thursday nights, 
where we just invite the world <laughs> to, to participate in a pronunciation, um, I'll call it a workout. It's a little mm -hmm. bit like a workout in a gym, only it's there online and we have a good time. Oh, that's amazing. I have lots of friends who are, are um, those types of teachers. So I will make sure I spread the word as yeah. well. For that. So what inspires you? Oh, people inspire me. There's no question. <laughs> uh, you know, when people, just the things people do, especially these days after we sort of lost our doing muscles during the pandemic, I feel uh, you sort of lose your mojo. And when people, gosh, when they go out of their way and they do something and they make a connection with another person, Mm -hmm. I, I just, I'm completely energized by that. I, people contact me and tell me what they've done with what they've learned. A teacher tells me how it helped a student. Mm -hmm. A student reaches out and tells me how Blue Canoe has helped them. Um, you know, there's a, gosh, there was a, a user, a Blue Canoe user, I think, and she's emigrated from Eastern Europe. And I, I won't give any real details here, but she had come as a judge from her country. Wow. An actual judge and had emigrated and needed to go back to law school and had the language barrier mm -hmm. and used blue canoe and you know reached out recently and said you know i'm i'm now a lawyer again and it's because of blue canoe that kind of thing it's just you know she took the time to tell us that <laughs> so that just it's that's what makes my day oh, my i love day. that thank you karen for coming and talking to us today um you do have an absolutely amazing story, whether you think so or not. It's, it's, it's great to hear those stories of women who help other women you know, push forward and succeed. And I think we need more of that in our community. But if you are interested in more um, how she got there, make sure to subscribe and have a great day. Thanks so much, Jamie.